drama, power, romance, intrigue, plot, counterplot, treachery, royalty, and a heroine. Welcome to ABC. And that's just the leadership team. Joking apart, I wonder if you can recognise where all that comes from. John mentioned it the other week, and it's the story of Esther. Fantastic book. I've been reading it recently. This is the final one on royalty, so I thought I'd add my five penny worth as well. I'm going to briefly give you a summary. It was the time of King Xerxes. That's his Persian name. I can't pronounce the Hebrew name. He ruled over 127 provinces that went all the way from India to the upper parts of the Nile. And scattered throughout those provinces were many, many Jews, scattered as they still are today. The queen, his queen, was a, a lady called Queen Vashti. Now he ruled, and when I mean he ruled, he did rule and reign. And you could only come into his presence if you were summoned. And he had this banquet for certain people and he invited the queen that she must attend. Well, she was having her own banquet for ladies of the court and others and she refused to go. So the upshot was he decided he needed a new queen. So a decree was sent out and messengers went throughout the land searching for a beautiful young lady. Well, Esther was part of the family of Mordecai. He'd adopted her and she was a very beautiful young virgin. But he was also quite well known at court. But he hadn't let on that he was a Jew and neither uh, Esther either. Well, it happened that uh, she was chosen with, I'm sure, many, many others. And for I think six months or more, they were treated to all the luxury paraphernalia that you could think of before they were paraded before King Xerxes himself. But it says in the word that she found favour, how sad, that Hebrew word, grace and favour in his sight. And she became his next queen. Well, that's just a little potted history. But the plot thickens. The second in command to the king was a chap called Haman. And he, you need to read the story for yourself, maybe this will encourage you, discovered that Mordecai um, was a Jew, but he got authority from the king that wherever he, Haman, went, people had to bow down to him. Well, when it came to Mordecai, he wouldn't bow down he would only bow down to his Lord and King, to his God. That's a word for today, isn't it? And so Haman was angry about this. And if you read through, he found out that Mordecai was in fact a Jew and that there were thousands of them living throughout the land. And so he went to the king to order a decree that all the Jews were to be killed because they wouldn't bow down to him. And because he was the second in command and had incredible authority, the king granted his wish. And so the plot came that they would all be killed on a certain day and whatever. Well, Mordecai spoke to Esther about it and he said to her, basically, you're the only one who can save our people. And you'll well remember the famous verse that everybody remembers. You have come, maybe you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And I'm just going to read you from chapter five, a few verses, and then I'll get to what I want to share with you. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes. Just interesting, it's just stopping there that to enter into the, the presence of the king, she had to put on special robes. Isn't it wonderful that we, 
as Christians are clothed in the robe of righteousness and that our King, King Jesus, has made access in a way direct to the Father and stood in the inner court of the king's palace. So she put on her royal robes, went into the inner court. Nobody could go into the inner court and they would be killed. Very much a picture of the tabernacle, the outer of the inner court. Only the high priest could go into the inner court. Again, another picture of Jesus. In the court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne, in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found again her sad favour in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near, touched the top of the scepter. And the king said to her, what do you wish, Queen Esther? What is it? Whatever is your request, it shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. I'm going to stop there. You can read the rest of the story to know what happened. It would make an incredible great Bible study, but I need to get on. And it reminded me very much about prayer coming to God. Here, Esther had to wait until the king granted her that audience and then touched his scepter. It's interesting that Peter and I were listening to a chap called David Holland on about prayer. And that's what I've just come to, really. And he mentioned something about God that perhaps many Christians see God sitting on his throne and by the side he's got um, a green light or a green button, a bit like the scepter that he'll push if he wants to listen to us or not. It's maybe that picture we have of God himself. The story of, of we call it the prodigal son, or the loving father, or the elder son, whatever you like. But the two sons had a different perspective of the father. The one who ran away was a bit afraid to come back. He's, he thought, what? Well, Father, think of me. I've wasted everything. I've wasted my life, his money and whatever. But Liddy, did he realise that the father was just longing and waiting and looking each day for his son's return? That was the heart of the compassion that the father had for him. And because he prepared a speech, but when the father uh, saw him, he just ran to him and greeted him. The other son thought, I've got to work. Show my appreciation. Do all I can to please my father. And yet little did he know that the father just wanted him to come and share everything that he had. They both had a different perspective of that father, father figure. They didn't understand the compassion, the grace, the love that God our father has. But he went on to say, um, David Holland, that now seated at the right hand of the father, is our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is our green button. But all, do you remember the word, all the promises of God are what? Yes, and amen in Christ. I remember a few years ago that I was preaching, I think it was on Father's Day of the Father, Heart of God. It's one of my favourite subjects in a sense. And if you've been listening to the morning devotions, Emma's painted, uh, Gemma's painted a great picture of the Father heart of God. And I just had to be enjoying the, as I was ministering. I noticed two different ladies, two different parts of the congregation were crying. And I immediately thought, oh, goodness me, what have I done? What have I said? How have I upset them? But it was only afterwards that I learnt that one had never had a father figure and the other one, the father hadn't treated her very well. And so they both had a wrong perspective. And it, that morning, their eyes were open to see how much the Father loved them. That Father, heart of compassion. So I want to encourage you, when we come to prayer, to look at God the Father. Not one far off, not 
one that's going to be of your head, not the one that thinks that you're not good enough, not the one that thinks you messed up today. You know, when we're hurting, can we go to God? Even if it's a little thing, yes, we can go to, to him at any time. You know, as parents, when our children are hurting, we hurt and we want them to come. And it doesn't matter whether they're 333 53. My Andrew's going through a tough time at the moment. He's really in so much pain with his Crohn's. My heart just cries out, I want him well. So let's come. Do you remember I, I shared recently the great minister who had that word, uh, the year of time and space? Because when we come in prayer, we, we're not always seeing answers straight away. And I thought of that verse and I thought of what he said. Do you remember what Peter said in 2 Peter 3 verse 8? Do not forget one thing with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. See, God is out of time and sometimes we want the answers straight away. And we're not always seeing those answers. But my encouragement to you is to keep praying, keep coming, and keep believing. Let me encourage you with one last verse from Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly. And the word boldly there in Greek means to come with a confident expectation. It's not barging into the throne and saying, God, you've got to, but it's coming, knowing that God is hearing knowing that God is listening, God is answering your heart's cry. Come boldly to the throne of grace, the grace of favour, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So dear friend, let you and I keep praying, keep believing to our Heavenly Father, who loves us, I believe, far more than we can ever hope or imagine. God bless you. Amen.